Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode. I do love shooting images on film. I love the colours of film. I love the warmth of film images. I love the way that images are rendered by the medium of film itself. But I will be the first to admit that it can be less convenient than shooting on digital. It can sometimes be a little bit of a faff and it's also a little more expensive than shooting on digital. So today we're going to have a look at a digital camera that's designed to shoot images as though they were shot on film. It's a very stylish little camera. It's also a quite a cheap little camera too. It's this one, the Fujifilm X-T10. This is a beautiful little camera and it really is one of the nicest cameras I've ever shot with. It's very small and I do appreciate a small form factor. Let me compare it to this Olympus Trip 35. So if I hold them together, you'll see that along the bottom, the width of the cameras is pretty much identical and we can also see that the height of the cameras is pretty much identical too. The X-T10 has a little more height because it's got this bulge here to put the uh, viewfinder in. But this is a very, very small camera, really nice, neat form factor. You don't notice it when you're out carrying it too much. It's not an obtrusive camera. A very, very nice little piece of kit indeed. This camera is unique in that it's a digital camera that's designed to be similar in look and feel to the old classic film cameras of the 60s and 70s. And you can see that that's reproduced on the top deck here. We've got a dedicated shutter speed dial with the letter A there for aperture priority, which is my preferred shooting mode. We have an exposure compensation dial here. We have a shutter um, switch, a shutter button that's very similar to the old cameras and indeed a switch that's very similar to the old cameras too. And I think this shutter release here is actually threaded uh, for a cable release just like the old cameras were. So this camera really does hark back to that classic era of SLRs from the 60s and 70s. Let's have a look all the way around. It's got a nice big screen on the back. Not a flippy out screen, unfortunately, but it is an articulating screen that articulates in pretty much any way you might want it to. We've got two control wheels on the camera, one on the back here, and then we've got this uh, four way unit here. We've got the menu button and the various other things you find on digital cameras. Coming back around the front, we've got another control wheel here. I think these control wheels are for uh, shutter and aperture values when you're using Fuji's dedicated lenses. I've only used this one with vintage lenses because it just seemed to be made for it. Now, I do like the look of this camera, but that wasn't why I bought it. I bought this camera because Fuji cameras do film simulations. Fujifilm were a major manufacturer of film, and they still do make film, in fact. But during the film days, they were probably number two to Kodak. They were a very, very big company, and they made a lot of widely respected and highly regarded films like Velvia, Provia, uh, the whole of the Fuji range. This camera has had presets installed in it that mimic as far as is possible, those old film stocks. It's made by Fujifilm, the people who originally made the film. So I would expect these simulations to be pretty authentic. There are two ways you can find the film simulation controls. One is to press the menu button and scroll through the menus. But the easier way is to push this section of the four way controller. And that brings up the simulations. Some of these simulations are better than others and personally my own favourite is Classic Chrome. I love that preset. It's absolutely beautiful. It makes such fantastic images. 
it's difficult to say what it is about it that's so attractive. I'm not sure it actually is a faithful copy of a Fuji film stock, but my goodness, it sure is a good looking one. Colours are very, very filmic. There's a little bit of blue in the shadows. It's just a beautiful simulation. There are lots of other simulations too. What else have we got on here? We've got, we've got standard, Velvia, Astia, classic chrome, that's my favourite, Proneg High, Proneg Standard, Monochrome, various black and whites on here, Monochrome, Monochrome with a yellow filter, Monochrome with a red and also with a green filter and a sepia setting too. But of these, I think the classic chrome is the nicest, closely followed by the Velvia setting. That gives you a really rich, highly saturated, just fantastic looking image that's full of life and full of sparkle and full of colourful energy. Just fantastic. I've looked at the black and white simulations. I've not used them a great deal, actually, I must be honest. And let me be even more honest. I'm not sure that they are the best of the film simulations on this camera. I'd really have to explore them a little bit more to be able to say, but they're not very different to each other. They apply electronic colour filters. Um, the contrast is fairly low. So I, I, personally, I wasn't all that thrilled with the black and white settings, though, as I say, I've not really played around enough with them and uh, I'm sure if I did then I'd be able to get them looking nice. Um, you can mix your own recipes on here. There is a website, I've forgotten the name of it, I'll put it on the screen. Um, but this guy has worked out lots and lots of recipes for different film simulations. All the versions of Kodachrome, uh, various Kodak films, various Fuji films. I forget exactly which ones. There's a cross-process one on there too. Um, some of the simulations will only work for some of the Fuji cameras. Others will only work for others because there have been various versions of the Sony cameras by now but whichever version you've got you're going to be able to find some really useful recipes on here. So this camera is perfect in my opinion for shooting vintage lenses on because of those film simulations and uh, I've had a lot of fun this week shooting various lenses on it. The one I've used the most is the Pancola the Carl Zeiss Jena Pancola, which gives beautiful results on here. I've also used the Helios 44 very successfully. I've used the Helios 40 on it. And this really is a, a lovely, lovely camera to shoot the vintage lenses on. Because it's an APS-C sensor, there is a crop factor with this camera. So any lens that you mount on here the marked focal length of the lens will be about as half as much again. So for example, if you put a 50 on here, Carl's Iciena 50, half of 50 is 25, so we add 25 onto 50, that makes this effectively into a 75 millimeter lens. Why? Because the smaller sensor is looking through a more central portion of the lens. Now that's the case with micro four thirds as well but with four, with micro four thirds the crop factor is quite a lot larger than this and you do lose some of the flavour and character of any vintage lens because you lose the edge of the shot. With an APS-C sensor you'll preserve more of the character of the lens and you do lose some of the edge of the shot but not a great deal. You end up with um, more than enough to preserve the character of the lens. As well as that, your effective minimum focus distance will decrease by about a third. So the minimum focus distance marked on this lens is, is 30 centimeters. Well, let's call it 30 anyway, it's near enough. So on an APS-C sensor, the minimum focus distance will effectively be 20 centimeters. Okay, so they do behave a little bit differently than they do on 
full frame. It's no real handicap until you try to find a wide lens for one of these and then your options become more limited. It's not quite such a difficult situation as with Micro Four Thirds there. It's very, very difficult to find wides for those cameras with uh, in certainly in vintage lenses, but APS-C you're much better served. For example, if you put a 24 millimeter lens on here, half of 24 is 12, so three towards 36, that gives us roughly the equivalent of a 35 millimeter field of view. The battery life on here is excellent. Um, I mean, this camera is five years old and I assume the battery is also five years old, but it holds its charge very well. I've been out and about shooting with this camera over the past week and I've only needed to recharge it right towards the end of the week. I've taken several hundred shots with it and it just seemed to have plenty of juice to spare. So that's a really good thing. Now for me, focus peaking is vital on a mirrorless camera to help me get accurate focus. I'm glad to say this camera does have focus peaking. It's not quite as prominent as it is on the Sony A7 that I have. Nevertheless, it is there and it's useful and it's usable. There is also an option on these cameras for a digital split image and that harks back to the old SLR cameras which had an optical system in which the image was split in the viewfinder and when the image comes together then it's focused. This has an electronic digital version of that and I have to say I'm not a fan. I had expected it to be something like in my naivety, I'd expected it to be something like what you see in one of these SLR cameras, but it isn't. It, it's, I'm afraid, um, a, a, a not very good reproduction of that. So, so for me, it doesn't work. I'm much more at home with focus peaking, but focus peaking is a very successful focusing aid. Does it feel like a film camera? Has it succeeded in what it's trying to do? Well, Yes and no. It partially does feel like a film camera and it certainly looks like one. There's no mistaking the identity of design, the continuity of design from those 60s and 70s cameras. And that's a nice thing, that's a really good thing. But, and this really is a, a, a quite a big but, it's very, very complex still. This is still a digital camera and it still has lots and lots of menus with lots and lots of options, most of which, personally, I'm never even gonna look at, never mind use. When I go out to do photography, I use the smallest number of settings that I can. And I can't help feeling that if this camera and the other Fuji cameras want to reproduce a film camera, they need to simplify. Do we really, really need that level of complexity? Those tiny fractions of tiny adjustments that we find in menus, do we really need them? If we look on this Nikon FE, this is a lovely old camera. Let me show you the top deck. So what do we see on this top deck? We see the shutter speed dial, which is pretty much the same as the one on the Fuji. It's got an auto uh, setting there because this has auto exposure as well as being a manual camera. We've got the film wind, which obviously isn't needed on the Fuji. We have an aperture control at the back of the lens there. And we've got a focus control right at the front. That's three settings. Now, it occurs to me that if one of the major manufacturers was to take up this idea and, for example, if Olympus were to produce a digital OM1 or OM2 with minimal controls, that would be wonderful. That would be a real step forward, I think, in photography. In my opinion, 
These digital cameras are utterly fantastic and they're a real boon, but they're just too complex. And if you're building a camera that you want to resemble a film camera, I think it's a mistake to build in too much complexity. I think the only company who have got this right when making digital cameras is Leica. I've never handled one of the newer Leicas, an M9 for example, never handled one, but I've seen a couple of reviews on them and they are minimal in their menus. I think that would be a way forward and any manufacturer who created a simplified DSLR that looked like a classic camera from the 60s or 70s, that had minimal controls and some uh, film simulations, even if that meant paying a license fee to whoever originally made the film, I think that company would clean up. Now, don't get me wrong, I love this little camera. This is a keeper. This camera cost me £160 for the body, and that is an absolute bargain. So I'm going to keep this little camera. It's going to be really useful, and it's perfect to use with vintage lenses because of those film simulations. I think it's the ideal camera to use. I do like full frame, so this isn't going to be my exclusive camera. I'm going to, most of the time, I'm going to use my Sony, but this one's definitely a keeper. So let me sum up with you what I really like about this camera. I love its styling. It's, it's beautifully styled. It looks like a film camera to some extent. And it's not laboured. It's not as it doesn't feel like somebody has tried to make a pastiche of a film camera. Everything here is functional, and so it doesn't feel laboured in that sense. So I really do like uh, that about it. I love its quality. It's beautifully made. Everything is metal, just beautiful. These dials are turned on the top. They've been turned on a lathe. Just absolutely lovely quality and engineering. I love its small size. It's a really, well, I was going to say pocketable. It's not quite pocketable, but it's a very small camera. There's no doubt about that. I love the straight out of camera JPEGs that it makes. No other camera can make JPEGs like this one, no matter how you play around with settings and adjustments. This camera is just perfect if you want very nice JPEG straight out of camera and you don't want to muck about with post-processing, which personally I don't. I also love its price. I mentioned it was 160 quid. That's really cheap for one of these. Really cheap. For the amount of camera you get, for what this camera can do, that's an absolute bargain. And remember, it's only five years old or so. This is still a very modern piece of machinery. Things I'm less keen on with this camera, well, I'm not keen on its complexity, I'll be absolutely honest. I think a camera like this that's made to resemble a film camera should resemble it in more ways than simply the top deck. It should resemble it in, in its whole approach to photography and I think this one falls a little short in doing that and there's a sense in which it's, as we say in the North, neither one thing nor t'other. However, it is what it is, and what it is is a beautiful little machine. It's very capable, it is uniquely innovative, and it, it's just extraordinary. I absolutely love it. So, that's it from me for now. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell before you go. And if you like the content on this channel, if you found it helpful, if you'd like to help the channel grow and develop, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time for some more xenography.